We at Rebo released the fifth in our transforming engagement series in early November 2022. We are producing this series in association with Mercer Marsh Benefits. And in this fifth report, which is titled Business Transformation Needs HR Transformation, we explore how business transformation driven by technology, new ways of working, the increasing emphasis on sustainability is now flowing through into HR transformation and what that means for heads of HR. If you would like a copy of the full report, which is packed with data and insight, you will find a link to it at the end of this video. The data in this new research demonstrates the huge shifts that will be taking place across HR strategies in the next couple of years. And we believe that this ongoing evolution, perhaps even revolution in HR strategy will have a major impact on all areas of business, including reward and benefit teams. To discuss this impact, I'm joined today by David Reeford, partner at Mercer. And we are gonna chat about the expectations around business and HR transformation. If while watching this video, you'd like to jump ahead to specific topics in our discussion, you can see the chapters on screen or you can click in the video timeline below to access a particular section. David, our research shows that nearly half of our respondents, so to be more precise, 46% of them, expect to make significant changes to their HR practices and policies over the next two years in order to address corporate purpose and long-term business sustainability. While as many as one in five, so 18% expect to go through a complete HR transformation, which is incredible. So I'd like to start off today by asking you, what are the three key ways you expect HR to transform due to the business transformation we've seen? And then once you've answered that, I'm going to come back and dig into each of those areas in a bit more detail. OK, uh, thanks, Debbie. Yeah, those statistics are much higher than we would have uh, expected to see or had seen in previous years. So there is uh, dramatic change going on. Uh, so in terms of the three ways, uh, I would say the first is uh, how does HR build the proposition that's compelling to their employees? So what we would call the EVP or the employee experience. The second thing is how is HR organized to deliver the promise it makes to its employees? So that's very much an inward look at function design delivery. And the third thing is how it engages with employees on that proposition. So that's partly about listening uh, in anticipation of change uh, and then communicating when those changes take place. Let's take that first point that you've mentioned there, the EVP, the employee experience. What would determine that for an HR or for a business? Uh, yes, I mean, we've seen uh, evolution of the EVP over the years, uh, and it's been called different things from total rewards to employee value proposition, uh, increasingly to employee experience, because it's really very much about uh, how it's received. Um, and then I think what we've seen are different factors or driving forces that have affected the way organisations look at that proposition. Um, I'm not wishing to make this a history lesson, I guess, those driving forces somewhat in order, uh, and I'm going back to something like the 90s, and I would say these are cumulative. It's not like one goes and another one replaces it. I think these just build and build and build as a series of forces that affected, affect the way organisations think about the design. But I would have said originally it was around things like flexibility and personalisation. Uh, then we've seen the emergence of diversity, equity and inclusion. I would then say that things like well-being became uh, became a strong influence on the way that we thought about the proposition, principally around sort of benefits uh, and employment practices. We've seen the emergence of purpose uh, and organisations need to think about what purpose means. Uh, and increasingly now we're looking at sustainability uh, from the point of view of ESG and how we think about sort of the multi-stakeholder view. Um, and then I guess in parallel to this, what we've got is the sense that organisations need to be more resilient. Uh, and that's really about thinking about the future of work, the future of the workforce and how we optimise the talent that we have access to. So I would say these are the products of how we think about the employment relationship and the availability of talent. Uh, and we've become much more employee centric more mutual, more adult adult and looking for trusted relationships uh, with our employees. 
uh, at the same time that we've moved into a much stronger seller's market. Uh, and therefore, we, you know, what do we need to do to attract the best talent into our organization? And then these things affect how we think about compensation, benefits and related policies, careers, working practices, and so on. You know, just as an example, let's think about flexibility. We would have seen that affecting the way we think about compensation benefits through the emergence of flexible benefit plans. But increasingly, it's very much um, around sort of working time arrangements, increasingly post-COVID where I work, um, and increasingly around uh, when we think about careers, you know, what it is and how I do it, you know, much more flexibility built into that. So that is a lot of different elements and areas and policies and strategies that you're talking about. How can HR deliver a consistent EVP then that aligns with that business transformation, which in itself is probably evolving and literally transforming? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, the, I think actually the question is, it starts much wider. Um, and that's how do you deliver an excellent and consistent employee experience when there's actually a distributed set of responsibilities for the decisions that are built into these programs. Um, so we know HR has a role. We need to think about the relationship between HR and the business, the extent to which employees can sort of self-determine things and what's the role of technology in enabling or supporting or uh, the processes around those programs. Um, HR really needs to get the mandate to do the things that it needs to do um, and do those things to the standard that others uh, you know, expect. Um, and that starts with dialogue. Uh, we need to uh, ensure that there's greater exchange between HR and the business. So there's uh, you know, increased proximity uh, between HR and the business and what the business expects. And then that gets us to a sense of shared responsibilities. And then we understand a little bit more about the mandate. Uh, and that can take us into answer the question about function design and effectiveness. So all that is only going to work if you really do engage with employees. And in times of transformation, people can, you know, can have lots of questions or feel unsettled. How can HR engage with employees on what is on offer during times of transformation? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, and it may sound like I'm talking in riddles, but employees don't always know why they're treated the way they are. And we know that when they know why they're treated uh, the way they are and they see the outcomes aligned with the expectations that have been set, then they're much more satisfied with, uh, with that treatment. So there's a lot we need to work on in terms of levels of transparencies um, and the way that employees need to feel equitably treated in the way that those uh, programs are applied. Um, and that's really about ensuring that managers act as advocates of those programs. Um, and I think you know this is even truer at this time uh, when organizations are transforming. Um, as we're seeing changes in the principles that apply to the way that programs are operated. So we need to communicate that more strongly uh, with employees. And as I say, as managers uh, need to uh, act as advocates of these programs, we need to make sure that they're educated and informed to be able to do that in a fair and consistent way. So there's actually quite a complex hybrid system there of, of governance and communication going on. I now want to explore a bit more around corporate purpose and corporate sustainability. Um, the research shows that just 29%, so less than a third of our respondents, have an EVP that aligns with their corporate purpose. Um, to be fair, two thirds, 64% in the research, say that their EVP aligns to some extent. So there's still a bit of a disconnect there, but I'd like to take that back a step. When we talk about corporate purpose and corporate sustainability in an HR context, what does that really mean? Yeah, I mean, you could take a very dry view, which is actually, if we make widgets, we need to understand how they, uh, you know, employees need to understand how they make those widgets faster, better, or whatever. Um, but I think that misses a trick. I mean, as I said earlier, I think what we've got are organizations that are much more concerned about the variety of stakeholders um, that have an interest in the organization or the outputs of the organization. And that's less about the products or services they provide, but actually a lot more about, uh, about impact on the outside world. Um, so I would say that generally speaking, people want to work for an organization that has positive impact on the world. Uh, so we see that in the organization's approach to ESG, uh, principally a commitment to the outside world, but this has to be enabled through employees. And at the moment, we know that organizations are increasingly targeting uh, their leaders with goals and incentivizing them on a long-term basis to achieve those goals. 
Um, but we need to understand how you can actually cascade some of that message to employees to ensure that they're enabling the organization to do the things that it needs to do. And they want to help. You know, all the evidence that we've got suggests that in connecting employees to that sense of purpose to the outside world uh, is totally engaging. The second thing then is that, you know, employees want to work for an organization that has a positive impact on me. I wants to treat me well. So this is very much a sort of internal view. Um, and we see that in the ways that organizations are evolving their EVP, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and the third thing is really about uh, they want to work for an organization that gives me an opportunity to make a difference. Um, so that's about connecting me to good causes. And historically, this meant sort of allowing employees to uh, you know, work on uh, volunteering programs. Um, but we see organizations uh, are more likely to help their employees evaluate their environmental impact. So we see uh, organizations um, you know, implementing uh, you know, apps to help uh, their employees assess their carbon footprint. You know, so can we enable them through our employees to reduce uh, carbon impact? Um, and they're doing more to help employees understand the purposeful nature of their work and the difference they make uh, through their day-to-day -day activities. I was just struck the other day, I was walking down the street, uh, there was an advert for a bank, I forget which one, um, but it was less about, you know, we are here uh, to do the financial transactions, but they were also offering safe space for people to go in if they felt that their financial measure, uh, matters were being in some way controlled or coerced by others. So suddenly a bank becomes a safe place and the bank has a social impact. And I think connecting employees to these sorts of things is a, is a really powerful way of, uh, of engaging with them in a, in, a, in a much broader way. Yeah, so building on that, what can HR people, what can benefits professionals do to then align to or influence the purpose and sustainability? Yeah, normally I would have said that things like benefit and policy changes uh, in organisations are pretty slow. So you would have seen big periodic decisions uh, to change things, often for the negative. You know, it's closing down plans or it's you know changing uh, car policies. So we're, we're moving to more convenient cash, things like that. Um, but now change is quite rapid, um, and this is driven by, I think, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sustainability, and general attitude towards purpose. Um, so, I, you know, maybe thinking some examples um, I where we're seeing a lot of emphasis is, for instance, a massive shift in attitudes towards uh, being more supportive to working parents. You know, there was, a, there has been an interest in, you know, how do we uh, improve, uh, the, you know, the, the maternity, paternity, paternity programs that we have in place. I think organizations are saying, well, actually, working parents you know, need support for the for the 18 years or 20 years after that. So how can we be more supportive through working time arrangements and so on? Uh, second thing might be things like inclusive benefits. So we're seeing organizations kind of expand the scope of things, you know, transgender uh, support, you know, menopause support, all of those things to uh, to to reach out and support people from uh, uh, all segments of the workforce. Uh, I think there's something about raised standards, and I suspect we're seeing that more now at times of high inflation. So organizations have been on a journey towards things like living wage uh, and doing that on a global basis and even thinking about the importance of raised uh, living wage standards uh, in right through their supply chain. So there's some good examples of organizations that take that level of responsibility. Um, but also, it's not just about wage. It's also about benefits. Can we ensure that we're providing uh, the protections that our employees uh, need through the minimum level of benefits that we're prepared to give them. And the fourth area is, is one of my personal favourites, the extent to which organisations are cooperating with good causes uh, to a greater degree. As I said, it's less about uh, allowing people to disappear for a day. It's more about saying, how can we uh, offer our um, capabilities and skills to good causes um, such that people feel they're connected and delivering social impact in that way? So incredible changes happening on the, the yep. reward and benefits on HR side generally. And part of that is also because corporations are having to reskill, look at their talent for this, this new mm -hmm. world that we're in. And our research shows that there will be big shifts in thinking around future skills and, and talent needs. Um, it's already happening, but they're there's going to be a huge upswing in proactive succession planning, use of data analytics and performance metrics, continuous learning, um, mapping workforce demographics. I've just picked out those four because we see that within the next couple of years, roughly eight in 10 of our respondents 
will be acting on these talent strategies, which is a much, much greater proportion of employers than the numbers who currently are actively focused on that right now. So, David, from your point of view, how do heads of HR need to think differently about the workplace? And what's the proposition that's going to engage our future workforce? Yeah, so I think there's two sides uh, to the answer. There's, first of all, is how employers are thinking. And you raised a lot of really important and key issues that are now becoming increasingly front of mind, um, not just for HR, but this is a business issue about availability uh, of appropriate talent is, um, because we have shortages. And, uh, and if, if we can't secure those needs, then you know, it becomes a business critical issue. Um, so from the employer side, I think we're much more likely to see organisations at the moment adopt a more sophisticated model for things like workforce planning and everything that you know, you've talked about in terms of succession planning and uh, career, career progression and so on, skills and reskilling really, really hot. Um, so this is about ensuring they get the best talent when they need it for as long as they need it um, and, and growing when they need to or uh, buying if that's a better option. Um, and then tapping differently into the talent ecosystem that's out there. Um, and that's about making a positive decision to buy, build, borrow, and so on, and not see contractors, for instance, as a necessary evil uh, to be tapped for the knowledge that they've got and then disposed of. So um, it's a different attitude, I think, which we would have seen a few years ago, where employees are everything and other, other uh, elements of the workforce are somewhat expendable. Um, and then we need to think about that from the employee side. So... Uh, I guess we typically see uh, that there is a binary decision with respect to how I want to offer my skills and services back to uh, employers. You know, if you cherish job security, protection, income predictability, and so on, then you'll probably favour employment. If you cherish choice, variety, sort of autonomy, flexibility, then you'll probably favour some form of self-employment. Um, but we know that people tend to favour all of these things. So engagement with, uh, with employees is, is a product of those sort of secure employment related uh, factors. But people also would like more choice, flexibility in, in the way that they work. So we're starting to see the emergence, actually, of more hybrid employment propositions. It's really interesting uh, where we have the benefits of employment uh, and self-employment. And all of the evidence seems to suggest where organizations somewhat deconstruct and they become uh, you know, more ambivalent about whether the work is done through an employee or, or a self-employed person, then what they have is a much more engaged workforce that's um, you know, delivering their skills in a, in a, in a much more committed uh, and engaged way. In the really different ways of looking at things going forward, but we can see that already happening in our world today. Our time is up, David. Um, thank you so much. Was, you packed a lot in um, to the few minutes that we had together for this video today. Could it be useful to explore some of the HR shifts that we're seeing because of all this business transformation linked to purpose, as well as us having a little bit of a look at the why behind the data in our fifth report, business transformation needs HR transformation. And just to remind any of our audience um, today. If you'd like a copy of this Reba Mercer Marsh Benefits Report, we have included a link at the end of the video. Thank you so much for joining us today.